It was super cool. We're small. I'm just a small town girl having a lot of fun. Then I went to LCC and I'm like, okay, really think this out and get a real life. You got you to gotta have a job when you get done with life here. So I went to LCC and I met this man named Guy Sandal. And I know you don't know him, but he's a youper, so you should know him because he's from Escanaba. But he um, was my teacher, and he was so inspirational. I'm like, this guy is insane, and I want more of this. So I dropped out of college, pretty much, after LCC. And by this time, he was the artistic director at the Purple Rose Theater, which I'm sure you guys have known because Jeff has big ties up here. So Purple Rose Theater, I did it in 95 and 96, I was apprentice. And being an apprentice is hard as crap. So there, your day consisted of you're going to work in the office or the box office. You're going to set up lights. You're going to tear down lights. You're going to do sound. You are going to do costumes. You're going to build that set. You're doing all the backstage stuff that all actors don't appreciate. And it makes you better because you get an appreciation for what goes behind what people are actually seeing. These tech guys and my son, I, they blow my mind. It's not a gift I have, but I sure know how to embrace it and appreciate it. And I think that that's the one lesson that I learned from theater, is really embracing it. And so I went to the Purple Rose, and at the end of it, Guy comes up to me and he goes, uh, they, I knew they were doing a world premiere of a Lanford Wilson. It was a big flipping deal, right? And I was an apprentice, and I was on the wagon like, woohoo! And he says, we want you to be in it. You're going to be uh, Luann. World premiere, Lanford Wilson, Pulitzer Prize winning. I'm like, this little small town girl, you want up there acting? And I just, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I never felt worthy of it until you're out there doing it and you're doing all the stuff that I'm telling you and you connect with it and you figure it out and you're like, man, this is such a fulfilling thing. I was shy, I was timid, but I came out of it somewhere in that. When I got done, I'm on fire. I'm like, I can go anywhere. I can go to New York. I can go to L.A. I've got the world by the hand, you know? And I said, what are you weak at, Lisa? And I was super weak at improv. And I thought, oh, gosh, am I going to go after improv? And I had a friend doing Second City in Detroit. And I went and watched him. And this troupe was amazing. They had, two, they had chairs, two chairs on the stage, and they had eight actors. And out of nothing, they're creating these scenes. And they're jumping in, and they're playing, and then they're adding on, and then they're creating. And you're like, what did I just watch? That came from nothing. That came from a suggestion in the audience that nobody knew was going on. My mind was blown, and it had a whole story. It had the beginning, and it had the inciting incident. It had the climax. It had the denouement. And you're just like, this is insane. I just watched that in an improv. And some of it was funny, and some of it wasn't. And that's what I think people don't get about improv. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. And you build a show. Or, or you take that to the next level and you say, I am going to take that chunk that we just did. I'm going to create a scene, or I'm going to write a book, or I'm going to do a play, or I'm going to take a screenplay. And there's nothing, when you change your frame of mind, there's nothing you can't do. If you say, that was so freaking funny, I'm going to create it. I did one, and it was it's timely back at then, right? It's not timely now. But I did a whole screenplay about a gay guy coming out of straight. Thought it was funny. Wrote the whole screenplay. It was funny to me. And we were doing all these funny jokes, like a Will and Grace thing. It was so inspirational, but I never did anything with it. You know, just because it was done. You know, at that point, it's done. But it was funny at the time. Um, I'm, I've got a whole thing that's more serious that I wrote about suicide. And that's timely. I'm progressing on it. I'm doing it. And if I have my druthers, we're going to do it. It's not funny. I'm going to do it because it's a yes and mentality. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so that's, that's just a little bit of my background. I love theater. I love improv. But then I walked away from it because I had a three-pound baby girl up here, and I lived downstate. And she needed so much care, I just dropped out of theater for a long time. And I took, I took all my love and put it into this little body, and then I started doing a little bit of directing, and I started doing a little bit of commercials, and I started in, and then I had this lovely son over here, and I thought, he deserves the same thing she had. So really, I'm 20 years out from doing any of it, and I miss it. It's like, it's something that's in your soul, and you miss it so much. And I, when I was asked to speak, I'm like, gosh, I don't know what I'm going to speak about. 
But I do real estate now. For 18 years, I did an optician work, working with a doctor that drove me absolutely crazy. And I said, I'm using these tools all the time. I'm connecting with people on their eyes. I'm connecting to them on a very emotional level that these people don't know that they're... I, I'm not a good person to have you nurses say, well, I got the diabetes, and I'm not that nurse girl. What I am is, girl, let's pick out that best frame for you, make you feel like a sexy little thing before you walk out of here. That was where I shone, and what I hope that the people that are running businesses take away from anything I say today is set up a platform in a playing area where people are set up to win. Not where they're going to feel like every day is a torture to go in there and all I can do is gossip about how shitty my job is. Set up a working environment that's a lot of fun for somebody to go to work. <clears throat> Something where people feel inspired and you're growing people, you're not just growing your business. Because that will make you a better person down the road. So that's where I'm coming from. When I got asked to do this, I'm like, how do you do that in a 45 minute thing? But here we go, we're going to do it. So. I love, they made this real, I look so cool when they did this. How do I start it, y'all? Okay, wait, Jake told me I gotta do this. And then I gotta do this, look at this. What? I look so official, look how cool that is. That's awesome, I'm gonna keep that forever on my website because I think that's cool. <laughs> anyway, I actually am calling this Breaking the Second City Wall or the Improv of Life. When we do Second City shows, we used to always have two titles, and they were goofy things, like you just take two things that had no combination together and throw them in, and it had nothing to do with your show. So I actually made mine relevant, but that's, I think it's really funny that they do that. And you'll notice it now. If you're going to go see a Second City, they're going to have two titles for all the shows. <clears throat> so like I just told you, I'm sick of seeing the world the way it is. I am sick of seeing bosses be bosses and not care about what their employees are doing or if they're growing or if they even care to be there. I'm sick of watching the news and everybody Debbie Downer. I am sick of the way people treat each other and I say, if I don't like it, how am I going to change it? And this is what I'm going to do today. If you change the way you're going to look at things, the things you look at will change. I was never going to be an actress. I was a 12-year-old little... When I was 12 years old, I was super shy, super introverted, don't speak, nothing. My mom always believed that children are to be seen and not heard. Um, you didn't do something because she said so. And that was a very difficult thing as a child, like, I don't get it, why, why can't I do that? <laughs> There's nothing I can do. But that was a very strict way that she was brought up. Um, I remember my daughter acting up one day and I said, uh, Katrina, and I'm explaining to her why she can't do something. And my mom's like, you don't have to explain to your daughter anything. She doesn't do it because you said so. Now, I love my mom. My mom's a beautiful person, but I don't mean to say it that way. But I said, Mom, I am not raising a puppet. I am raising a human being that has to be in this world. And so I'm going to raise this kid differently. And I did. It was different from what she did. It was different from what her parents did. And you just break the rules where you see fit. You set up different rules and you watch people grow. Oh man, my voice is really bad today. I'm sorry. Guy Sandville, I'm going to go back to him because he was the best director I ever had. And this is where you have to make your very first shift before you even think about improv. Listening is probably the most difficult skill that we have, and nobody does it right. Nobody ever listens to somebody truly because you're thinking the next thing you're going to say to combat them because by gum you're right and nobody's going to be better than you on that, right? We have yes but because I said so. You can't do that. How many things do we hear every day that's negative? And I always said listening is the act of wanting to speak. And it truly is. When you're on a stage and you've got all these lines and you've memorized them by yourself and then you hook up and you're with that person on a stage all of a sudden they look at you and like, that was a little bit different than what I was expecting to hear, right? He said that differently than what's in my head. He touched me and it sent a different message to me. If you're listening to somebody, truly listening, it should affect the way you respond. So we, I always think that theater, improv, motherhood, whatever, starts by truly listening to what your people around you are saying. Now, how you choose to react to that is what I'm hoping to change. If you're having a fight with your husband and your thing is, yeah, but, you just stopped the conversation. You're not listening. 
It's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to elevate to a whole other different thing. But if you're like, yeah, you're, you, I see what you're saying. <laughs> okay. And I think we could fix that, but guess what? You know, maybe you have to just address it a little bit different. I had a boss who was a doctor, and he he ruled with the, you know, he's a man of the whole building. It's his business. He had all women working for him. He was kind of a sexist kind of guy. I was, it was really infuriating to go to work with him. The girls all gossiped behind him, the ones that didn't work with him all day long. And I was just like, this is the most screwed up environment. I feel like I'm not growing here, but I stayed there for 18 years. And finally, I just started talking back to him. Look, I don't know why you're doing that, but, but when I get in, the girl's like, I can't believe you said that to him. I'm like, I can't believe you sit there and take that all day long. If you don't believe what he's doing, say it. There's ways to say it and not sound like an idiot or lose your job. So say it. Say what you mean. Say statements. Don't, don't just sit there and take it. There's a way to change your environment, or if you're a boss, there's a way to make an environment that works for everybody. So start with listening, verbal and nonverbal. And then know how you want to speak. If you look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary, I love number two, to hear something with thoughtful attention and to give it consideration. That is huge. That is listening to me, and you have to give it consideration. So I know I haven't gone into improv yet. I'm going to. I love Tina Fey. I love her. Love her. Love her. Because she speaks the truth. She's out there preaching a lot of this stuff right now. She does artwork, the most beautiful artwork. If you want to see some of the stuff that Tina Fey is doing, look up Yes and Tina Fey. But I love this. Life is improv improvisation. I can't talk. Saying yes allows you to move forward. You're not putting up stoppers. You're not blocking. You're saying, yeah, let's do that, you know? It's a different way of thinking because you're not denying somebody. You're actually looking in a way to grow the conversation and grow the people around you. So, yes, but he's going to jump off a cliff and he's going to jump into that shark. There's other ways of looking that. You can fly. You can hand glide. You can take a balloon. There's different ways to get over that hump. I didn't think I could get up here and speak for 45 minutes, but if you say yes and then I'm going to figure it out, that's how you do it. Yep, I'm going to do that, and let's figure it out. So I want to talk a little bit about my daughter first. Uh, she was probably about five or six, and she's talking to her little brother, and she's telling them a story in the backseat of the car, and I'm driving. And she tells this story, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was a real story. My five-year-old just said a real story. And I said, this is amazing. I'm going to go home and write it down, just like she said it. And I did. I put it in her baby book, and I'm like, what a little treasure I'm going to share with my kids someday. And we come up here, and Debbie's at, Debbie's her cousin, and we come up to dinner, and she goes, Aunt Lisa, can I show you my drawings? I'm like, yeah, show me your drawings. This girl drew like nothing I'd ever seen. She had little fairies and flowers, and I'm like, what is this kid doing? She was 15 at the time. And so I said, Debbie, I have an idea. I have this book that Katrina, or the story that Katrina came up with. We need to have you illustrate it, and for Christmas we're going to give it to all the grandmas, right? First of all, can I just show you some of these drawings that she did? And it's got notes all over. But these are her drawings that she put to my daughter's story. This is amazing. This is not a 15-year-old artwork, right? This is not 15-year-old artwork. She was beyond her years. This story is the cutest story, and she illustrated it. So we did a small printing, we did like 10 copies, and we took them to the grand, was like, Merry Christmas! And you know what, they loved it. They were like, oh my gosh, we need to make this a real kid's story. We gotta do a huge printing. And so we printed up like 100 of these suckers. And we went to craft shows, and it was so cute, because right here in Marquette, um, the Children's Museum was carrying these. And you guys seen them? Have you seen these ever? Okay, the Children's Museum is like, oh yeah, if that's done by a kid, we want them. Debbie is now finished college, and she, um, actually, let me show you what she, I just, here, okay, so this is what she made. She did this in college with a bunch of people. She took our little book, our little book, and, and, and just so you see this, look at, she made advertisement posters for, for our booth. Look how cute this is. Debbie did this at 15. We're out marketing this. We're at, we're at craft shows going, this would be $10, but I'll have the author sign it for you. I mean, we were like making money on this. 
So Debbie went out to college and she said, I'm going to create it into a, um, the kids can get on an iPad. And they can get on the story and they can push the character. And move. And so it's animated for an iPod for kids. It's or an iPad. It's so cool. It is so cool. And then this is the advertising she has. So she's still doing stuff with this. So she's amazing. And then my daughter went off to college and she's blowing my mind because she wants to be a doctor. I'm like, what? I don't have kids. I'm not smart enough. I would have never said be a doctor. And here she is. She's going to be a doctor someday. Okay. Find a way to pay for that. Okay. My son over here is only 15. I know he looks really old. He's only 15 right now. But he, uh, he's really a computer genius. He writes programs. He writes entire websites. He hacks. He does hacking. You know what I'm talking about? With hacking, they try to break into your system. So they did this thing at Northern, and they're like, hey, can you, uh, you're going to compete in this. And he did. He went in and he had another guy. They're hacking into these systems and capturing the flag, right? Have you guys heard of this? I've never heard of this. I thought, I think that's illegal. I don't think you should be doing that. But it's by NMU, so they can't be wrong, right? I'm like, okay, go ahead and do that. Yes, Dan, do it. So he does it, and he's up against all these people. And he took second place, my friends, as a freshman. So everybody's like, how did you learn how to do that? He goes, well, I'm so taught. I'm thinking, man, I am going to get arrested because my senior son was going to hack into programs. I thought it was crazy, but he did it, and he took second place. The only team that beat them were two seniors going off to college to tech and, I don't remember, U of M or something. I mean, they were going to go off and do this as a career. I'm thinking, my kid's a flipping genius. And you know why he's a genius? Because I said yes, and a friend of mine said, best thing you could do for your son is throw $1,000 at him and have him figure it out. You need to have him figure out how much it costs to put that on there. And, and how, what does it take to write a program? What does it take to do that? And he did it. He said, oh, this is really hard. I thought, that's the best lesson you can give your kid. Not popping him in college and paying $100,000 to see if he can figure it out in college. Yes, and him. And let's see what, how he grows. Because he will grow up to the environment you put him in. Um, he did this thing. Because I think my son is hilarious. There's a rush you can jump in this way. That's why I'm confused when people say that they don't like my school. I'm addicted. Uh, maybe they just need to get hyped up. You know, I, I always get hyped up by repeating that like, slogan out loud. You know, just do it. Hey mom, we got a snow day and I want you to videotape me. He comes down, he's wearing that jacket and the slippers. I'm like, dude, I have no idea what we're doing, but let's do it. I taped him walking through the dining room. And when you don't know, we're outside and I'm like, it's freezing. It is a snow day. I'm like, this dude is nuts. And he does this whole thing, smacking like they do, like they get all ready when they jump in. And he does this. I'm laughing so hard. I don't know how he got a cut without me doing it. And when he got done, I said, you only got one stroke, you gotta go back and do it again. And he was like, ah! But it was hilarious, and that's how he spent a snow day. Now, he could have spent a snow day studying, he could have spent a snow day on a computer. I don't care, but he, when he's like, Mom, you want to? Yes, let's do that, and. Because yes, and is about embracing that person, embracing that idea, going all in, and let's see how we can make it better. I had no idea what he was doing, but I was gonna play with him, because playing is how you get your best ideas. These guys are doing a podcast. And you know how they do it? They throw out a word or an idea, and then they feed off of each other. That's improv, my friends. That is like, hey, what'd you get out of that? Oh, yeah, let's do that. And it builds, and it's cool. And if you try that in your environment, I guarantee whatever you put out there will change. And if you take, if you take your office plan that's really boring, and you're going to do something, and you put down new rules and say, everybody's got to say, we're going to embrace all of them. I swear you'll get different work out of them than what you would have gotten before. So, yes, Anne. 
I also want to talk about my mom, you know, because I love her. And she's a very different personality for me. I'm a high ID, which I'll talk to you about that later. And she's very secretarial. She was a secretary for politicians, and she was a secretary for lawyers. And she's so smart and not like me. Her joy right now, she volunteers at the hospital filing. That's what she does. That's great, Mom. <laughs> no, but she loves it. She's on fire for it. And, and then she gets to go to work with Nikki with the babies, and she holds them. And this is how she's doing her retirement, and she's happy. Um, when I needed a secretary, uh, and I still bounce ideas off her, she's going to get a copy of this, and I'm going to be like, help me write the book now, because we're already writing the book. Uh, that's how I got asked to do this. So I want to implement some of this in there, and she's going to help me. But anyway, I'm doing real estate. I am freaking out. I'm so busy. My business is growing faster than I can handle this down Up here, it's a whole other ball game. But I said, Mom, I need, to, I need you to come straighten me out. Because I'm a girl, I'm like, woo, 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 I got 5,000 ideas. And she tells me, OK, let's narrow it down to like two of those, you know? So she's really good for me in that way. She files. She organizes. I look at papers and don't have an anxiety attack because I, that's my anxiety. It's like, oh gosh, i got to do an hour paperwork. is like torture for somebody like me, as you can tell. So um, my mom was really great. So I, I, I'm, under, I'm stage managing a show, and I said, Mom, I need backstage people. OK. She has no idea what I'm asking. She's going to go backstage. She's got a gimpy leg. And she grabs my brother, and they show up. It's Pippin. We have this huge cast. It's musicals, moving sets in and out, and doing costume changes. She's like, yes, yes. She's like, okay, you need to do that. You need. To. She was stage managing backstage, and she didn't even know it because I put her in this environment. She agreed, and she jumped in, and she killed it. So when I needed a stage manager from then on, I'm like, hey, mom, let me show you how to stage manage. You know? And she's like, okay. My mom is great like that because we can't fail in her eyes. Whatever. She can't believe I get on stage and do stuff. My dad is hilarious. He's got a sense of humor like my son. <clears throat> and it's one of those things you're just like, dude, you are so funny. And you say it under the radar, and it blows my mind when they do it. And I said, Daddy, I need a sheriff. The sheriff just dropped out. I'm directing the show at this point. And I said, the sheriff dropped out. You want to do it? He goes, yeah, OK. And he shows up, and he starts doing this. And he's with his, my seven. And he's like, OK, we've got to run lines. They ran lines incessantly. And, um, he has to go to a Super Bowl because he does headsets for MSU. I'm sorry, he did. So he went off to an Alamo Bowl. And he comes back, and all of a sudden he's got boots, a tan gallon hat, he's got a bowl, what are those bully over boys, whatever those things are. He's got a sheriff's pin. I said, uh, Dad, we got costumers. Costumers will do this all for you. Well, I'm like, I would have let you keep it. <laughs> but he wanted to, he, and he looked good. My dad looked good that day. And, I, and here he is embracing it. He hadn't been on stage. He kicked butt. He's on stage with some amazing women. He's like, best time of my life. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to take this to a dark side, but I, um, my dad died. Away, and I just went, to, I just got back from my, my stepmom's house. And she pulls out that 10 million hat. And I just realized that everything about you is going to live our past. So if people have the idea that you're the yes and person, you have that environment, they're going to be drawn to you because it's a safe environment. They're not going to be knocked down for what they believe. It's a safe environment to grow and explore, and it's going to live beyond you. It's a legacy. I didn't know I had a legacy, but that is going to be my legacy. I'm going to hope that my kids say, gee, she created an environment that we grew in. Um, so that was my dad's story. That was hilarious. So, so improv, listening, yes and. Those are the first main rules, listening, yes and. You walk away with nothing else from this entire day, that's what I want you to walk away with. Now, there's another part of improv that we say is don't ask a lot of questions. So if somebody gets out there and they just initiate a scene, because remember you've got a couple of chairs and actors. That's all you've got on a set. If somebody gets out there and they initiate a scene, and you say, that's not really the way it happens called denying that person. Or you say, well, what do you mean by that? You just deny it. You're not growing anything. You're just getting out there. You're actually putting the brake on because we have to catch you up to the other actors like you, right? It's not fair. It's not the way to play. And I don't recommend it even in real life. 
instead of just throwing out questions and like, uh, instead of being slow, like, even if you say something profoundly stupid, make a statement. Make a statement that adds on to it and see where it grows. Don't ask questions, just make statements in your life. It'll work well for you. So, I had, this one came to me last night. I don't know. Um, the person gets out there and they said, I am riding a tomato. If you say, what, you're riding a tomato or whatever, instead of saying that, if you say, you are the most beautiful caterpillar practicing on that tomato before you become a butterfly. Did you just not create a cooler scene than you're riding a tomato? You know what I mean? It can, you can do something, it can be as stupid as you want, but if you get on board of it, instead of shooting it down, it, things will grow. And it may grow in a weird way, it may be in a cool way. You may think, and that's the stupidest thing, I can't believe the audience saw it. All right, they saw it, they lived through it, they're gonna forget it in five minutes. But I saw something really cool in Chicago. I, and I don't even know if I should say it because if they turn it into a show, I'm stealing it. I don't really want to steal from the Chicago city. But <clears throat> we went to the show and they're doing an improv set at the end. And this lady comes out and I love her. She's like, we have decided a way to take the shell off the tortoise so that they can mate better. And the guy, bust up. He's like, what the heck am I going to say to that? And he's like, that's brilliant. You took the shell up, you know, and then they froze the scene. I'm like, oh man, don't cut it out yet. That's, that's, that's cool. And all of a sudden, another, another guy jumps in and he takes the form of the tortoise without a shell and he's going at She's like, oh, he really likes you. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And it just grew into this great scene. I'm like, that is so brilliant. I mean, it's stuff like that that you're never going to see in a normal play. And if you see it improv, you're just like, that is so on fire, cool, and, and I hope that they don't sue me for ever saying that. But it was so brilliant. It was so brilliant. Um, I was telling you about that doctor that I work with, and there's nothing to light a fire under me that could tell me I can't do something at this point. <laughs> because if you tell me I can't do it, I'm going to do it. So this doctor, I've worked with him for 18 years, and I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing the scene. He's like, don't you think you're a little old to be starting a new job like that? Really? So I completely said, I am down to two days a week right now. And he's like, you're going to you're gonna back down now? And he says, you haven't even started yet. I'm like, yeah, I'm down to two days a week. My friends, I started getting clients. And I'm like, um, I need to drop down to one day a week. And um, he's like, should I be getting a replacement? I'm like, yes, you should. Should. Because you just told me I can't do something because I'm too old. Let me show you how I'm going to kick butt at this. And it, I, I'm telling you, it took me in a whole other direction. If I'm sitting here walking away from my job, I'm like, geez, I think I just put my job in hand. And he's like, we've done it before. My husband is brilliant. My husband, my husband just knows how to support me and my stupidity and my craziness. He's wonderful. But my husband was in a really bad job at the same time. He was in a job where He's at a computer, day in and day out, in the office, so that his boss can see his butt in that chair when he's working every day. He would assign a task, this is what you're going to do today, this is what you're going to do today, this is what you're going to do today. And micromanaging every 15 minutes, I want you to write down what you're doing. I went to the bathroom. You know, I mean, it was, it was that ridiculous. If you ever do that to one of your clients or your people, fire yourself, because it's rude, it's a waste of time. And one of them, he even wrote in there, I think, like, I just wrote on this thing for about 15 minutes. You know, I mean, I think it was that petty. Um, and that's not the only person I've ever heard going through that. I've heard a lot of people going through that. So my husband gets exposed, he gets sent in a seminar, and they're doing things completely different. And they are doing a story, they're like, we have this idea, this huge idea. How do you guys want to build it? We think it has to, these three things have to happen. Okay, if that happens, how are then they get smaller tasks, right? It's called the one, three, five system. So you have a big idea, you break that down into three smaller ideas, and then you break each one of those down to five tasks. And then you say to each person on your team, I want somebody to pick up some of these. Tell me what you're willing to pick up and how long will it take you. Now, if people are picking their own tasks because they excel at it, they're going to fabulous work and they're going to go much faster than you think. So try that in your business people. I know there's some business people in here. Try that, the 135 system. And let people pick their own tasks and then watch them grow. 
Because if they're picking it out and they're deciding the path and you're not dictating it, you're actually going to grow a lot faster and better. So try something like that. Um, this is what I talked about. The chairs. So when you have two chairs, I'm sorry, this, I, I just love this one. So if you have two chairs, it could be a car, it could be a spaceship or a submarine, it could be anything. The, the, the popular one is a car. You got the taxi guy driving, guy gets in the seat. You do a quick scene and you boot him out of the car and somebody gets in and you have a no, whole new seat. It's an actual game. We actually have a game on that. Um, and it's a really fun way to just throw stuff out there. Like robbing a bank, that's always a fun one when you're in the car scene. And so, like, they could be anything. It's a time machine, it's a cubicle, it's a dinner table. If you just put a bunch of people in a room and say, what's our plan? Just watch what they do. Well, I think this is this. And see if it can grow. Y'all are doing music stuff. Put them in a room with a bunch of instruments and see where it's going to go. I love that idea. I actually think it's brilliant. I hope you do it. <laughs> I hope you do do it. Maybe we'll do it today. You guys interested in that? <laughs> they have a bunch of instruments that we could do a lot of fun things with. We might have to try it. Tina Fey again, because I love her. I love her. I love her. But she says it so much better than I can that I'm just going to show this to you. And you can find the slide online. Um, it's the rules of improv. The first one is to agree. Always say yes. Respect your partner. Let him grow and let him shine. In other words, don't always steal that scene. You may be funnier than that person that has started the scene, but if you're a constant stealer of a scene for the ba dum bum guess what? Nobody wants to work with you. Nobody wants to work there and set up your little scene so that you can take the ba dum bum okay? Nobody wants to do all the work for you to take all the shine. So know when to break that, know when to give and take all the time. Figure that out. If you're always taking and taking and it's about me, you're not living in the right moment. You need to be a giver. It makes the best actor. Be open-minded. Second rule is yes and. So always agree is to say yes. And is to give it power. Add more to it. Agree. Give it something to build it up. Give it the power that it needs to grow. The, set, the third thing is statements, right? Remember, don't ask any questions. Just try statements for a while. When you're in your everyday, try to say yes to everybody. Just try it. You're going to see people change the way you do things. Your husband's going to freak out if you stop disagreeing with him all the time. Guess what? It's so cool. So I just say try it. And then the very important thing is <clears throat> there are no mistakes. There are no mistakes in improv. There are no mistakes in life. There are no mistakes when you're sitting there with a patient and you just go pick up your life. I just said something. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think that there's a certain value to being real with somebody. I had a patient, um, it was Katrina, I ran and um, I, had to, I had to teach her glasses. And I'm looking at this girl in her eye, and she starts crying. And I'm like, Katrina, I have no idea what's happening right now. She goes, I just lost my mom, and you look like her. So I take this kid into a contact lens room by herself so she can cry. And we talk. And I follow up the phone call, how are you doing, sweetie? You know, I'm breaking a little bit of rules. That is not a client, that is not a client patient thing. But if you have that connection with somebody, embrace it because you're not going to get people to connect like that very often. So if you're given that gift of connecting with somebody, use it. It's awesome. Um, breathe. If somebody goes up on their lines, oh, and I did this. I was four years old. I'm like, I'm doing a two-man show. It's a vlog. But oh, I'm having a blast, right? And we get to this part, and I'm like, wow, I just went up on my line completely. Completely. It was gone in and out. You could have driven a semi right through beeping the whole time. And I was just like, <gasps> so the first thing you have to do when you have that freak out moment of something just kicked you in the gut, you need to stop. You need to breathe. Because the first thing we do is, <gasps> so take that moment and breathe. And then you take a look at the person you're on stage with and you connect with them. And I swear to you, you've practiced it enough or you have enough knowledge, if you just sit there and connect with that person and breathe into it, it will come to you. If you have if you have the kick in the gut moment from whatever, just stop, don't react, breathe for a little bit, because breath is life, take a minute. If you have stage fright, breathe, take a minute, and then go for it. Um, another thing that I do when I have anxiety is I, I try to think my body out, right? So I, I came in, I told Jake, I'm like, I'm so scared going up here right now. I talked 45 minutes straight. I was really nervous about it, right? So 
So we do this thing called the Queen Walk. Okay. So I I will uh, I do this. We do this in the purple rose. We walk in the circles. And you get our queen walk down, and you start walking a little taller, and you start breathing a little better, and those heels don't hurt as much because you're queen walk, right? You're gonna build up that self esteem. And I did it today, but y'all don't know. And I walked in, I'm like, hey, what's going on in here? What are you guys doing? Music? Oh, awesome. You know? And I was scared shitless to come in here. But if you take yourself out of it, and you walk around, and you, you take your power back, it's really good for you. It's really good for you to feel that power when you walk into a room. I used to do it all the time when I was cute, and I was the most powerful woman when I walked into that room. And let me tell you, you knew when I walked into that room. It's a lot different when you're a lot older, <laughs> but I have to build up a little bit more. I have to go meet my husband's new bosses and everything, and I'm going to the Christmas party. <laughs> so I'm nervous about this, right? Like, oh, so I'm going to clean walk a lot that day, and I'm going to take my power back. I'm going to breathe into that, and I'm going to be the most interesting person you ever met. I might not be the most pretty. I might not be the smartest room person ever, because I'm not going to be. But I'm going to be the most interesting. <laughs> so take your power, whatever that is. <clears throat> that goes along with connecting, taking, connect. The other thing is that guy used to do this thing about stealing from the best. And it's true. We do this in... We do this when we learn lessons. Like I just gave you a bunch of lessons from the Purple Rose and Second City because you know what? Those are the best. Those are the best of the best and I learned them and how do I take them and bring them to you? Steal from the best. Steal it, own it, make it your own and present it like you own it. And then let hope somebody else walks away with just the best after you. And then lastly, the most important thing I want to say is know when to break the rules. These are rules. These are rules for playing. These are rules for growing. These are rules for relationships with your husband or your kids or your boss or other actors or whatever. Because guess what? We're just walking through this life together. Figure out to do it with somebody. To, to bring value to somebody else is the most rewarding thing you'll ever get. But if you have to break that rule because it's destructive or it can't be done, know when to break that rule. <clears throat> and then walk with it. Own it. And we can walk your way through life, everybody. <laughs> so, thank you very much. It was very nice to have you all here. <laughs>
awesome show, Improv. SNL, is there anything any better still out there? Uh, whose line is it anyway? In living color. And then I had to put Key Peel in here because Keegan, this guy right here, he was with me at Second City in Detroit. I love Keegan. And he's a yes and guy. He's like awesome. I, so Key and Peel, check them out. They're awesome. Truth and Comedy is the book that I studied when I was at Second City. Highly recommend it. It's kind of an old school one, but it's really cool when we're not doing Harold and everything. It's like the physics that make up uh, improv. Tina Fey, Bossy Pants. I already told you I'm a huge fan of Tina Fey. Get this book. Get this book. Get this book. Also, Yes Please with Amy Poehler. So she's not just saying yes, Anne. She's saying yes, please. Please give me more. Yes, bring it on. And I love it. Rachel Dredge was also at Second City in Chicago at the time that I was in Detroit. So I, I read these books and I'm like, wow, look what they were doing when I was doing that. And they're amazing. These are amazing people. These are people that take risks, they yes in, and they really don't care if they fail because they'll pick up again. And that's all I got, folks. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs>